We are beginning this hour with those latest developments you just alluded to in this ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. The head of the mercenary group that led a rebellion against Vladimir Putin over the weekend, breaking his silence, saying he was not attempting to oust the Russian president, but simply demonstrating his protest over the Russian military. Now, the actions led by Evgeny Prigozhin raising questions on Putin's control and the stability of one of the world's largest producers of oil now. Here to discuss the rippling ramifications of it all, we've got Michael Hanlon, Brooking Senior Fellow and Director of Research in Foreign Policy. Uh, Michael, great to talk to you today. Give me your assessment on the effect you think this rebellion or not rebellion will have on the ongoing war effort. Greetings. I think the effect will likely be modest, but we can't really be sure. I think in the short term, it looks like Putin has prevailed, even though Prigozhin is, as you say, pushing back a little and now trying to you know, defend himself a little bit more fully, maybe make this seem like less of an out and out showdown with Putin and maybe even establish a little bit of a base in Belarus. But the fact that he's talking about that latter idea for the Wagner group, underscores that he really has to retreat here because, of course, Belarus is essentially a Russian puppet. So you're not going to get any kind of protection or sanctuary just because you're operating there, either at his individual level or in terms of the Wagner group. And as you know, Russia has been trying to bring the Wagner group back into the fold, so to speak, in recent months. I think that effort will continue, maybe even more so. And uh, at the same time, I think that we probably won't see a dramatic effect on Russian fighting positions inside of Ukraine, uh, because chances are that Putin is going to go slow here and not sort of dismantle the Wagner group too quickly. So he's going to try to make sure the Wagner people on whom he depends for some of that fraction of the front line still feel like they are better off fighting for Russia than fleeing or fighting against Russia. And uh, my guess is if they're being asked to defend trench lines, they will have enough morale to do that, even in light of what's happened. So my best guess is no dramatic change within Russia itself or on the Ukrainian battlefield. But of course, uh, we'll have to see. And things could change over a period of months, partly as a result of this. Michael, what message, though, do you think this sends to the rest of the world, not only inside Russia, but more specifically what it means for China, which we know clearly has close ties with Russia? I think China is just going to keep hedging and, you know, doing what's best for China in this regard. They don't send weapons to Russia, as best we can tell. I don't think they'll change that policy. They uh, give Putin a certain amount of rhetorical support in the sense of blaming NATO expansion for this conflict. But they don't go so far as to, you know, uh, actually help him in any material way besides just buying stuff they want to buy from Russia anyway and frankly, buying stuff that we want them to buy from Russia. Because as you know, we've been part of this oil cap concept, which actually is a way to keep Russian oil and gas on the global market, even if we in the West choose not to want to buy it ourselves. So China's going to stay in this middle zone. Uh, they're pro-Putin at some level, but they're not going to go so far as to become an active participant or to uh, send him any appreciable amount of weaponry. And uh, I don't think they're going to change their view. They'll be a little more nervous but they'll also recognize that he's probably survived this challenge from the number one potential rival he had in the entire country. And and therefore, uh, it's hard to see somebody else rivaling Putin, challenging Putin, mounting a mutiny or a coup attempt uh, anytime soon. At least that's my best assessment. And that's what I believe the Chinese will conclude as well. So, Michael, it doesn't sound like you think there's a dramatic shift in the war, but you did have the likes of Secretary of State Antony Blinken at least over the weekend, sort of pointing to how this could signal some Russian fragility here. And I wonder, from a policy standpoint, how do you think this shifts the discussion for the U.S. and NATO allies? Well, it only shifts it a little. I mean, Secretary Blinken's, I, I certainly think, correct. But the weakening may be modest, and Putin won't want to acknowledge it. And therefore, it will play out over a period of weeks and months, not hours and days. And so what I think you could imagine, let's say we get to the fall and the Ukrainians have taken back some of their territory. My guess is they won't get back more than, I don't know, a quarter of it, uh, you know, the 17 percent of their country that Russia still occupies. And then Putin's got a decision. And so does Zelensky. And so do all of us. Are we going to sort of help get ready for another round of similar fighting in 2024 with no end in sight to this conflict? Or are we going to sort of think of ways to compromise? And at that point, in the fall, I'm suggesting Putin may say, you know, I've got internal problems. The economy's not in good shape. 
uh, the Wagner group remnants are still, you know, upset about what happened. Maybe I'm better off not fighting this war for three or four more years. Maybe I'm better off looking like the peacemaker trying to wind it down. I could imagine that kind of calculus shifting a little bit, at least partially as a result of what's just happened. But again, I think it'll take months. And this is just speculation. It's also possible that by the fall, Putin will have completely stamped this whole incident down and out of our memories, or at least out of active, you know, policymaking, and he won't be affected in the least. Michael, what about the image that Russia is still trying to portray? At least up until this point, they seem to be trying to send this message that it's business as usual. You mentioned the fact that you don't see this having any real uh, material impact, at least for right now in Russia's uh, advancement in Ukraine. At what point, when you're talking about the fact that maybe this conversation could change by the fall, what would be the trigger of that? I think that, you know, Putin will internalize the, the extent to which he's seen a serious domestic uprising against him. Now, he managed to rein it in. And now the guy who instigated it is saying it wasn't really against Putin anyway. And I don't know that there's anybody else who could do this besides Prigozhin. Still, Putin's got to recognize there's some unhappiness here. There's some unhappiness in the sense the Wagner Group's been more popular than his own military. They're a year and a half into a war they're not winning, even if they're also not really losing at the moment. Uh, you know, he has to think hard about, does he want World War I? <laughs> you know, does he want four more years of carnage uh, with uncertain prospects? Or does he want to say, you know, whatever fraction of Russia or of, of Ukraine he still holds by the fall, let's see if he can solidify his control of that in some kind of an armistice and get back to some quasi normalcy. It won't be like it was before, but you know, maybe he could end the fighting and end the economic decline of his own country. That's possible. But this would just be one of the factors that would go into that thinking and uh, maybe not even the most important. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, a, a better case scenario. I wouldn't say the best case scenario, but but from a market's perspective, clearly investors watching the commodities market to see you know, how in fact, uh, Vladimir Putin could potentially weaponize the energy markets. I mean, that's been dangled before. Is there any likelihood because of what played out now uh, of that risk increasing? Well, yeah, I think that I just get nervous about any kind of big war in the middle of Europe going on indefinitely because I see no reason to just assume that things will be you know, extrapolated out and sort of follow the same trajectory they've been on. So the fact that the war sort of stalemated, that energy and grain markets are sort of semi-stable, that we haven't heard a lot of nuclear threats in the last few months. I don't take any of that for granted as a prediction of what may ensue this summer or fall. And at some point, somebody could have a big incentive to try to really destabilize or disrupt the whole situation. So I'm you know, a pretty big proponent of trying to find a way to wind down the violence relatively soon, even if Ukraine doesn't get everything back that it wants, uh, and maybe you know play the longer game diplomatically to try to get back the full extent of its territory rather than think it can do so on the battlefield. There's no reason. Wars don't tend to go in straight lines. If you look at a certain period of a few months, uh, whether historically or in, you know, in real time, it, it might seem like you have a period of a few months where you have more or less a steady state. But then there usually is some kind of a divergence off of that. And it's an inherently unpredictable business that we're in right now. It certainly is. Uh, Michael, it's, it's good to get your perspective today. Michael Hanlon, Brookings Senior Fellow and Director of Research in Foreign Policy. Thanks.